Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is an interesting one from a subscriber and it asks if I can explain what the worst personality disorder is out of the 10 personality disorders. Now, of course, if you watched my videos before, you know this would be a very challenging question because it's highly subjective. But I am going to try to answer the question in a roundabout way. Not so much what's the worst personality disorder, but what would be the most symptomatic or interfere with functioning the most. Because the word worst really doesn't have a scientific definition that we can use. But we can certainly look at different symptom levels and functioning and say, well, this personality disorder seems to have more challenging characteristics in those areas than, say, this other personality disorder. So I'm really going to look here at four areas that I think capture a lot of what we see in terms of severity, frequency, and duration of symptoms, and interference with functioning. The first area would be emotional distress. So this would really include a lot of potential symptoms, but depression, anxiety, intrusive thoughts, compulsions, panic, dissociative symptoms. So there's a lot of different symptoms you could put under this kind of emotional pain category. The next category would be interfering with functioning specifically at work. And then I'll take a look at interfering with social relationships in two areas, romantic relationships and friends and family. Now these four areas I'm looking at, of course, don't cover the entire spectrum of what's considered to be symptomatic or line up with symptoms or functioning or anything like that. Rather, it's just an attempt to reduce this very vast area into something manageable for a video like this. So I know there's more to having a personality disorder than just these four areas. But I think most people would agree these four areas are affected and certainly should be a focus of treatment and therefore allow some area for comparison. So with a topic like this, I'm really not pulling on one specific article. I'm using my experience working with all 10 of the personality disorders and also literature that I've read over several years. I'm not aware of one article that really answers this question. And even if there was one article that answered it, this is just such a vast question that you would really need several articles in order to draw some sort of conclusion. So again, really this becomes more or less my opinion, but based on my experience and what I've read. Something else that's important to keep in mind is I'm really looking at each of the personality disorders here and going through these dimensions based on no comorbidity. If you take into account comorbidity, for example, depression and borderline personality disorder, or substance use disorder and borderline personality disorder, or antisocial personality disorder, that really changes things dramatically. Here I'm really looking at it as if an individual only has one personality disorder and no other personality disorders and no other non-personality disorders. So no major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, substance use disorder, PTSD, none of the other disorders. In clinical practice, of course, it's actually not common to see an individual with just one personality disorder and no other diagnoses. So really I'm excluding comorbidity, but you can't discount the importance of comorbidity. If you want to compare the personality disorders though, it really does have to be removed at some level. So important to keep in mind that it really changes how we look at personality disorders when we do factor in comorbidity. So I'll start here with the cluster A personality disorders. This would be the odd eccentric cluster. I'll move to cluster B, dramatic erratic, and then the cluster C, which is the anxious fearful cluster. So starting with cluster A, the first personality disorder here is paranoid personality disorder. Now in terms of emotional pain or emotional distress, that first category I'm talking about, I would say with paranoid personality disorder, again on average, and that's really what I'm using here for all these disorders, I would say it's a moderate level of emotional distress. In terms of work, I've seen people do pretty well with paranoid personality disorder at work. It's not necessarily something that would interfere a lot. It really depends on the type of work. Certainly though, the paranoia, the suspiciousness, the distrust can rub coworkers the wrong way. So again, it's highly dependent on the type of work somebody's doing. Now in terms of romantic relationships and interference, we do see quite a bit of interference with paranoid personality disorder. As a matter of fact, one of the symptom criterion specifically points out 
that individuals with this disorder tend to suspect their partners of infidelity. And of course, we know that having that suspicion, especially if it's not founded, can really be detrimental to relationships. In terms of family and friends, what I've seen here is these relationships are tense. So there can be friends, there can be, of course, family relationships that are maintained. But there's a tension when somebody's tendency is to hold a grudge and to be suspicious a lot of the time. Moving on to schizoid personality disorder, here I would say the emotional distress is typically low compared to the other personality disorders, but that doesn't mean there's no emotional distress. Again, we're talking about on average. In terms of work performance, I would actually say that schizoid personality disorder is associated with doing fairly well, particularly in jobs that don't involve a lot of social contact. And again, this is right in the definition of the disorder. One interesting element I've seen with this disorder, and again, this is in the symptom criteria, one of the criterion indicates being indifferent to praise or criticism. This is usually, of course, thought of as negative because somebody's not sensitive to praise or criticism, therefore can't respond in a way that would be expected you know, socially. But the way I've seen this manifest in terms of work is that particularly if somebody's indifferent to criticism, they can work with a supervisor that tends to be very critical that other people don't want to work with and it wouldn't bother them. So that's one aspect I've seen with schizoid personality disorder. It really sets it apart from the other personality disorders. Now, in terms of romance and friends, the symptom criteria spell this out pretty well, and it's been my experience as well working with individuals with this disorder. You're not really going to see much of a romantic life or having a lot of friends typically associated with this disorder. We see that individuals with this disorder tend to have little or no interest in sex with other people and they tend to have no close friendships except for maybe a first degree relative. So we see kind of a interesting profile with schizoid personality disorder in terms of not expecting a lot of emotional stress usually, doing okay with work, but really having no romantic life and a very limited social life. Now the last personality disorder in cluster A is schizotypal personality disorder. And sometimes this is incorrectly thought of as being very similar to schizoid personality disorder, but really there are some key differences, the odd beliefs, magical thinking, elements like this, and the, also the unusual perceptions. I think that really stands out. We also see some degree of social anxiety with schizotypal personality disorder, although that's not really one of the first things we would normally think of. I would say in terms of emotional pain, there would be more distress with schizotypal personality disorder than we would see with schizoid, and maybe around the same as we'd see with paranoid. In terms of work, individuals with this disorder, because of the odd beliefs and the magical thinking, tend not to do well in a wide range of work activities. But again, if it's restricted to something that doesn't have a lot of social contact, sometimes individuals with this disorder can do fairly well. Now, in terms of romance, there's a potential for romance, probably more of a potential than we'd see with schizoid personality disorder. But of course, it is limited. And I'd say the same thing occurs with friendships and family relationships. They're going to be a little bit strained and limited because of the nature of the disorder. Now moving on to cluster B personality disorders, and here we have antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. So the first one is antisocial, and this one's pretty interesting when you think of these four dimensions that I'm looking at here in this video. With the emotional distress, a lot of people would think that it would be low because they're thinking of the construct of psychopathy. And with psychopathy, particularly factor one psychopathy, we do see low emotional distress. But antisocial personality disorder is more associated with factor two psychopathy, so characteristics like impulsivity, irresponsibility, and of course criminal activity. So I would actually say that it may be low compared to some of the other personality disorders, but it's probably higher than most people think. Now in terms of interfering with work, antisocial personality disorder I think has a fairly definitive impact on work because of the criminal behavior and because of the criminal record associated with that behavior. Work is going to be really restricted in terms of what employers will offer somebody a job if they have an extensive criminal history. Now we also see the behaviors themselves, the criminal activities, can interfere with work. So I think that's one of the more challenging elements we see here with antisocial personality disorder. Now in terms of romance and friendships, I would say a moderate level 
of difficult to hear, probably not as severe as most people would think. Again, the behaviors, you know, you see some that are pretty disruptive, like irritability and aggression. If those symptoms are endorsed, that would be pretty problematic to relationships. But if it's something like impulsivity and lack of remorse and those criminal activities that are resulting in the diagnosis, it may not interfere as much as one would think with romantic relationships and friendships. The next personality disorder in cluster B is narcissistic personality disorder. And of course, this one comes with a lot of strong feelings in many directions. I would say that even though there are many conceptualizations of this disorder, I would say that the emotional distress level is probably moderate. Now, I know some people will say, no, it's low because individuals who are affected by grandiose narcissism, which is what we associate with narcissistic personality disorder, are generally resistant to criticism. I understand that point of view, but what I see is somebody who has difficulty in relationships. Of course, I'll get to that in a second. And I think this does cause emotional distress. Also, with the conceptualization that somebody's defending, protecting a fragile sense of self, I think this probably has more distress than a lot of people would realize. When we talk about the work performance, though, here, narcissistic personality disorder, I think, is mixed. But in general, if they reach a certain level in an organization, I think they tend to do fairly well. So if we see narcissism combined with, like, Machiavellianism, for instance, now, again, you could consider this comorbidity, which I said I wasn't going to get into. But if you do look at this one angle, the work performance tends to do fairly well. Technically, of course, comorbidity has to do with disorders, and Machiavellianism isn't actually a disorder. It's just a set of personality traits. So other presentations of narcissistic personality disorder, though, that don't involve the goal orientation and the limitations with impulsivity, meaning impulse control, I think we'd see more of a disturbance at work. Now, in terms of romantic situations, probably the romantic outlook would be fairly good, but because of the manipulation component, it wouldn't be good for necessarily the person who doesn't have the disorder, right? So you have the individual with NPD and you have their partner. The partner may not feel that the romance is going too well because of that manipulation and that abuse that can occur. But the individual with the disorder may think that their romantic situation is fairly good. I think really we see the same thing with friendships. There's manipulation. So the individual with the disorder may think it's okay, but friends may keep a distance because they are worried about those narcissistic traits and because these traits can be offensive to other people. When somebody views themselves as entitled and grandiose and superior, other people understandably want to create distance there. Moving on to the next personality disorder in cluster B, we have borderline personality disorder. And just like narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, we see a lot of strong feelings about this disorder. And I would say the emotional distress level here with borderline personality disorder would be severe. And really, we see that right in the symptom criteria. So a chronic feeling of emptiness, suicidal behavior, impulsivity, affective instability. So we see a lot of areas that point toward extreme or at the very least severe emotional distress in some cases. Now the work outlook can be okay. It really depends on if the work environment has to do with a lot of relationships that are going to be a focus of some of the personality traits and cause like the unstable relationship pattern or maintain that. If those symptoms are seen more outside of work in romantic situations that have nothing to do with work, then I think work performance could be okay. I've seen a lot of people with this disorder do very well at work. If the workplace contains a lot of romantic situations, then maybe not as well. So in terms of the third area I'm looking at here, which would be romantic relationships, by definition, they're going to be troublesome with borderline personality disorder. Unstable relationship pattern, intense relationships, an idealization devaluation cycle, the constant anger that we see with borderline personality disorder, frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, really a lot of symptom criteria here point to difficulty with romantic relationships. And to some extent, we could see the same thing with friends and family, but usually it's not as severe as the romantic interest area. So we see more disruption in romantic relationships with borderline personality disorder typically than we see with friends and family relationships.
The last personality disorder in cluster B is histrionic personality disorder. And we don't see this disorder used very much anymore. Of course, the disorder does exist. We see it in clinical practice. But we don't see the term in the research much anymore. It's typically associated with a fairly low level of emotional distress. And individuals with this disorder, if they're working in creative environments, tend to do pretty well. Usually, we would conceptualize somebody with this disorder as having a high score in the openness to experience trait from the five-factor model. So they would be imaginative, they would like artistic elements, they would be creative, as I mentioned, and engage in fantasy. So with some types of work, that could be a real asset. With other types of work, of course, it wouldn't be an advantage. In terms of romantic relationships, infidelity is part of what we see sometimes with histrionic personality disorder, so romantic relationships would be strained. A lot of times individuals with this disorder like new relationships, so that's not always good, of course, for maintaining long-term relationships. Now, in terms of friends, I kind of see the same thing with histrionic personality disorder that I described with narcissistic. A lot of times people are just going to keep their distance, but that doesn't mean that an individual with this personality disorder couldn't form friendships or have good friends or could maintain family relationships. Now moving on to cluster C personality disorders, the first one here is avoidant personality disorder. And here we would see severe and sometimes extreme emotional distress. This disorder is characterized by distress that's quite pronounced. It would be worse a lot of times than what we picture with social anxiety disorder. Now social anxiety disorder I believe is distinct from avoidant personality disorder, but one conceptualization would have avoidant personality disorder is an extreme variant of social anxiety disorder. Again, I don't really think that's the case, but I see the point that's made there. And it does really allow us this way of thinking where we think of avoidant as a fairly severe personality disorder in terms of emotional distress. Now, in terms of impact on work, usually it does have a fairly significant impact on work, similar to what we see with social anxiety disorder. In terms of romance, however, it's mixed. What I see here with avoidant personality disorder is romantic relationships are hard to start, hard to initiate, but once somebody's in a romantic relationship, they tend to stay no matter what. Now, of course, that's not always a good thing, but it does mean that long-term relationships are actually somewhat likely with avoidant personality disorder as compared to a lot of the other personality disorders. We see really the same thing with friends and family. Those relationships tend to be maintained. Now, of course, family relationships would start early, so there wouldn't really be a difficulty starting them. But friendships could be difficult to start, but individuals with this disorder could maintain those relationships for a long period of time. The next personality disorder in cluster C is dependent personality disorder. Now, dependent personality disorder has a lot in common with borderline and histrionic personality disorders, even though it's in a different cluster. And usually the emotional distress level I think of with dependent is moderate. In terms of work performance, it's mixed. If that dependent relationship that the individual has is stable, then work can actually be something that's not too challenging. But if there's a lot of changes in who that person's focusing on in terms of support, I think that can affect work performance. There's no other major reason work performance would be affected strictly within the symptom criteria we see with dependent personality disorder. So I think definitely the possibility exists for a fairly good work experience. Now in terms of romance, if somebody with dependent personality disorder is looking at the romantic partner as the object of support, then I think this could be fairly difficult. And if they're not looking at the romantic partner as the person that's supporting them, that can also be difficult. So I think that romantic relationships get strained for a few different reasons, but really the presence of needing that support of that set of symptoms, that's really troublesome all the way around, I think, for romantic relationships. I think for friendships, it can also cause a strain. And with family relationships, sometimes it can be a problem. Dependent personality disorder is one of those disorders we don't see diagnosed very often, and there's a wide range of presentations associated with it. So we don't have a lot of information on it, and there's a lot of variability. Now the last personality disorder in cluster C, and the last one I'll be covering, because it's the last one of all 10, is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Probably of all the personality disorders, this has potentially the worst name, although you could argue that borderline personality disorder the name really doesn't fit either. 
But I think one of the difficulties with OCPD is there's another disorder called obsessive compulsive disorder that has both obsessions, intrusive thoughts, and compulsions, behaviors that address those thoughts. And obsessive compulsive personality disorder doesn't have either one, but it still has the term obsessive compulsive in the name. So it doesn't make a lot of sense that way. Now in terms of emotional distress, I would say that OCPD is associated with low and maybe sometimes moderate emotional distress. A lot of times the reason somebody would come in to be treated with OCPD would be because a romantic partner or a family member complained to them and said, you need to go seek treatment. So I don't see the emotional distress component as really pronounced with this disorder, like you would see with borderline personality disorder or schizotypal personality disorder or something like that. Now in terms of work performance, OCPD really stands out here from the other disorders. I would say usually somebody with this disorder would do very well in an environment where they're appreciated. So if a company really appreciates somebody who's productive, organized, has attention to detail, usually they're really going to like somebody with OCPD. There's an extremely high level of productivity associated with this disorder. Now of course just like I mentioned with a few of the other disorders, it's really about finding that right job, finding that employer that appreciates that particular set of personality traits. Now in terms of romance, I find it to be fairly limited with OCPD because so much focus is on work. So work generally may be good in terms of productivity, but romantic life typically suffers or is non-existent. And the same thing with friends. Uh, we see the same thing here with narcissistic personality disorder where friends may keep a distance and histrionic personality disorder. We see that happening sometimes, but also just not much of an interest in forming friendships because again, everything is about work productivity. There's a real intense focus element that we see with OCPD. So those are the 10 personality disorders and my impressions of four dimensions of the disorders. So in terms of overall, again, speaking back to the original question, which personality disorder is the worst? That's impossible to answer, but which personality disorder is the most symptomatic or interferes with functioning more than others or the most? It would appear that the ones that stand out would be borderline personality disorder, avoidant personality disorder, and maybe to a lesser extent, narcissistic, antisocial, and schizotypal. But of course, as I mentioned before, this is really just an average. So one of these disorders, depending on who has the disorder and the manifestation, of course, could be the worst for that person. Here I'm just talking about, in general, what I've seen. Those disorders that I indicated tend to have more symptomatic profiles associated with them. In terms of those that would be the least symptomatic, again, it's highly dependent, but in general, I'd say OCPD really stands out, histrionic, dependent, and schizoid really stand out. So that leaves paranoid as one I didn't indicate in either category. I think it's really tough to put that one either over the fence or inside the fence in terms of being symptomatic in comparison to the other disorders. Sometimes it can have a fairly significant effect, and sometimes it doesn't. So again, I talked about it as having moderate emotional distress. It's really right in the middle a lot of times. But either way, those are my impressions in terms of the 10 personality disorders. What I look at as more associated with symptoms and interference functioning and the ones that maybe don't have that same association. Just as is the case with all my videos, I really appreciate comments on this video. I know there are going to be a lot of different opinions about which personality disorder has a more symptomatic profile associated with it. And I'd like to see your opinions in terms of what you've seen, what your experience is, and maybe some points about these personality disorders that I missed that could indicate that the profile would be less symptomatic or more symptomatic. I'd be really interested in reading those comments. I hope you found this description of the personality disorders and symptoms and functioning to be interesting. Thanks for watching.